discover your daily deal at the dating site for automobiles, streetvw.com. Here's general manager John Luciano. You can save thousands on this showstopper, the revved up Volkswagen Atlas Crossport, or get ultra low monthly payments on all new and used vehicles, like on the Volkswagen Atlas. And remember, many Volkswagen vehicles are famous for outstanding fuel economy. And meet the Volkswagen ID4. This affordable electric SUV is going to change everything. Hurry and discover your daily deal now at streetvw.com. Street Volkswagen of Amarillo, 5000 South Sansi. Welcome to the Automotive Architect Sales Podcast. My name is Ron Garbrick. Thank you for joining me this morning, this afternoon, this evening. It doesn't matter when you show up and listen to the Automotive Architect Sales Podcast. It is going to be the number one automotive podcast in the world. I'm already in 40 different countries and people were sending me reviews out the wazoo. I appreciate everyone that is listening and getting just a little bit of a golden nugget here and there uh, every once in a while. I've got great guests, and I got a special guest on today. His name is Philip Cheatham. Philip is the CEO of Central Desking, inventor of the Secret Desk Log, the Daily Desk. Philip is the author of Dealership Process Secrets. Philip and his company, Central Desking, cause is all their cause is all about improving the lives inside the dealership and that's what every one of us needs is is something that will help improve the lives of the dealership phil believes there is a, a stagnation and innovation inside the automotive space to help us get better at what we are good at human interaction and whatnot instead phil believes the companies like Carvanas and Vrooms are trying to innovate around human interaction and says in a long term, they won't succeed because they just don't get it. So this, this is going to be a great interview today. I've been listening to Philip quite often on Clubhouse. I've been stalking him on Facebook, just trying to get a little bit of knowing what Philip is all about. And by the way, check out his book, The Process, The Dealership Process Secrets. Now you can get it on Kindle. You can buy the book. It's on audiobook. Um, if you go to Amazon right now, you click on, you can listen to a sample. And it's actually Philip reading the book. How many, how many when you read a book of, a, of an author and you want to check it out, it's not that person that's actually reading it. So you get some English guy or you get somebody with a foreign accent and it just turns you off from wanting to even read the book because you can't get that, that voice out of your head. That's me. You, you may be different, but I don't know. But I mean, great reviews on Amazon talking about this book. I personally don't have it, but I am going to order it today as soon as, uh, we get done with this this show because it's great. I mean, if you look look at what they're saying, this book is a golden ticket for dealership success. Being in the car business for over 12 years, I can say that this book is the real deal. Being in an internet director at a Lexus and Subaru, just to name a few, I have been at some of the highest volume stores in the nation. And author Philip gets straight to the point and doesn't beat around the bush when it comes to the tactics. After reading this book, I feel confident that I could take any dealership to the next level and be successful anywhere I go. This book is definite most read if you have ever been in sales and want to succeed in life. So further ado, I have to introduce the man, the myth, and the legend that that Amazon per persuades this guy philip chino how are you what's happening ron so happy to be on your on your show and thank you for the introduction uh i think that i think you just beat the last person at the best introduction i've ever had so uh <laughs> truly appreciate that uh and yeah I'm, I'm so happy to be here with you and and, and get talking man i love your show uh, yeah, our number one thing, the number one thing for me ever since uh, I left the dealership, being inside the dealership, and, you know, we, we can get into talking about that, but that's just improving the lives inside the dealership. That's pretty much everything that we do, everything that I do has to fit into 
into that box of improving the lives inside the dealership. It's not about making things that are better than the people that are inside the dealership. It's about making things that help the people in the dealership do what they're already great at and do it better. And that's what I think is missing from uh, a lot of the vendors in the vendor space and just the, just all around. I think that's uh, that's the base root of a lot of a lot of problems that we have. So that's uh, thank you for having me on the show. And that's uh, that's what I definitely love to get out at first. Improve the lives inside your dealership. And you've been doing this since you were 21, right? So yes, I was hired at a. Uh, Highline store when I was 21 years old as a product specialist and a lot of people don't like this story but it is what it is I was I was I showed up for bells you know I worked as hard as I could inside that dealership and uh, within two months they asked me to do F and I and I literally I talk about it in my book I had no idea what finance was so my first question was well what do you guys do back here I know my customers come here after uh, after we after i basically get them to say yes right they end up in the finance office but i don't really know what you guys do and the finance director just wanted to take a shot on me saw how dedicated i had been to working inside the dealership and and how, how hard i was working and just thought that i was the right choice thankfully for him because the owner and my gm and the gsm at the time thought he was crazy but they gave him the uh you know, they said, OK, go for it. Try it. You know, results are on you, essentially. And, and because of him, I ended up in uh, in the finance office at 21 years old, wow. super young. Yeah, we all know that we uh, we learn a lot in that office. So I learned, you know, all the stuff that you learn inside that office uh, quite a long time ago now. It, it would have been that was January 2005. So we're talking going on uh, going on 17 years. Wow. Yeah. You find out when you get into the finance department that you're not just a paper pusher. You're actually, you gotta, you're, you're the money making of the dealership due to the fact where, you know, the contracts and, and all the legal purposes and, and making, you know, if they're losing money on the back or on the front, you're trying to make it up on the back and, and, customers think oh man this is where you're like going through walmart and you see all these these candy bars and chargers and candles and whatnot they're just trying to get you to pile more on but in all reality you're trying to help protect the customer because when they go into the service department the last thing you want is the customer to re to remind you that you should have pushed a little bit harder on having them buy protection because now they're paying a seventy five hundred dollar uh, service bill but, you know, in all reality, if they do buy that product two years down the road, they're going to come up to you and they're not going to remind you on how much you bumped them on payment, but they're going to remind you on how much money that you just saved them because of that issue. So um, first and foremost, this podcast is exclusively sponsored by Dealer, Dealer Elite, the most recognized automotive social network in the world. Sign up now and engage with the best and brightest in our industry. Also a sponsor is Street Volkswagen of Amarillo. They have the new ID4. They're trying to electrify America. So go to Street Volkswagen and check out the new inventory they got at www.streetvw.com. And if we don't have the uh, ID4, we can get you one. Don't worry about that. They're they're selling like hotcakes at every Volkswagen store in America. They're going to revamp the whole industry with electricity. And also sponsoring is Garv Automotive. For all your educational training courses, go to GarvAutomotive.com. That's G A R. V as in Victor, automotive.com. Another day, another dollar. Owning a dealership is a constant squeeze to make sure your sales staff is performing and hitting their numbers. So how can you make sure your dealership doesn't just survive, but thrive? Because when you leave deals on the table, you're basically flushing money down the toilet. So let's break down where your deals are leaking and how to fix it. Sure, your CRM software is great for record keeping, but even the best CRM doesn't compare to an organized salesperson's personal hot sheet on a piece of paper and everyone knows it. CRMs were built by software developers, not car guys. Most sales staff are passionate about picking up the phone, shaking hands, and closing deals, not inputting data. 
What if there was a way to organize and prioritize your hottest deals, your deals working, without using a CRM at all? Your staff would have perfect clarity into who is closest to buying on an up-to-the-second basis. And they could get on the phone and keep the ball moving without ever letting a single deal slip through the cracks. So instead of scrawled handwritten notes or relying on an avalanche of dense, boring spreadsheets, your sales staff gets the information they need distilled into a lightning-fast summary that they'll glance at throughout the day and actually use. With the Daily Desk, you and your staff will have a perfect handle on deals to focus on in your make a deal meeting exactly what's happened and is happening at any given time during the day whether you're inside the dealership or not notes as to why each one of your customers that entered a negotiation didn't buy in every single day suddenly being organized becomes automatic the entire process feels like a game not a chore as the daily desk gives your staff the exact insight they need to perform and you can send text with directions to your sales staff instead of questions you can and should keep your CRM when you get central desking because the daily desk is basically your souped up desk log, simplified, visual and updated, while your CRM still handles things like automated emails and the more thorough archive of your entire database. Think upgrade, not replacement. So give your staff the up to the minute, super simplified info they need to close all deals for a tiny fraction of what a CRM costs with the daily desk. The Daily Desk, man, that is interesting. You know, when when I got into the automotive industry, uh, we had BD, uh, BDC, but the BDC was like five and a half hours away. And these individuals, BDC agents, would call customers and they would schedule appointments. Well, I'm anal. I want to actually talk to my customer to confirm that they're coming in. So I would call them on the phone and say, hey, I was just notified that you – a plan on coming in at 2.30 today. I just wanted to put a face to a name and let you know, and, and I would do it on video and put a face to a name and let you know that um, uh, I would be expecting you as for Ron, as soon as you come into the dealership and I'd get a text message back going, I told that lady that I wasn't coming in. So I already had a bad taste in my mouth with, with the BDC agents lying, saying that, Hey, you have an appointment when you really didn't have an appointment. So it, so it would bother me. And so I had to get to the point where I called Dallas and said, no more calling my customer. If I get an internet lead, let me follow up with them. Let me talk to them because I don't trust you. So moving on to, and, and then I moved on to being a general manager and then moved to street Volkswagen. Well, they had a BDC department inside the dealership. And, you know, I, I always would void that department because of the relationship that I had with the past BDC. And three months later, uh, the GM asked me, Hey, Ron, will you take over my BDC department? <laughs> <All And right. laughs> anything but that i don't <laughs> lie i don't like them they lie they're manipulative they just try to fudge the numbers and he goes make the bdc the way you want it then and i said really and he goes awesome. all you so for 10 months you know when i walked into the bdc department they were only selling 36 units out of the bdc and i was like that's that's got to change real quick so I pushed them to sell over a hundred cars a month coming out of awesome. them because I told them, I said, the BDC is the heart of the dealership. That is where the blood is flowing to. So we can spread it out amongst the other departments. I said, what you're saying on the phone is not working. You're trying to sell the car and not the appointment. I said, we got to start selling the appointment and not the car. Yes. And let the salesman worry about selling the, the car because, the, I mean, if they're looking online and they're highly interested in that vehicle, that means they're already sold. Now they just got to find a, a person they want to buy it from. And so when I got them off of trying to sell the car and answering all the questions about the car and just say, man, this is a hot ticket item. This car has been 
popular for the last two days. If you want to buy it, when would be a perfect time to come in? It's already available, but talk about availability. Would you be available at 215 or 445? And get that appointment sold and then get that hot lead to one of your closing salesmen so they can go ahead and get the customer in the dealership, show them the car. And personally, I would sell and get numbers agreed over the phone, text message, email. So by the time the customer came in, they just test drove the car, walked right into finance, bought their protection, got in the car and drove off. So I like this central desking. I like what you have came up with. Explain to the listeners what, what it really does and how it can help dealerships these days. So really, Ron, what it is, is it's a, it's very similar to the old desk log, uh, but uh, all your follow up becomes very prioritized and essentially it allows your entire staff to have a communication and, and it allows them to have an ease of looking at who they should follow up with. There's something in there called the hot sheet. Uh, and what that's going to do is is basically have an ongoing workflow at the sales desk. It's going to have an ongoing workflow uh, for the BDC, for all the salespeople, specifically maybe the people, the management side involved later in the deal. Uh, the communication of what happens inside the showroom with the product is really why I left the dealership. Uh, is just because I was like, everybody's got to have this. Uh, it's I never obviously... You know, I'd been working in, in dealerships for 15 years, uh, really when I started to see this thing that we had we had created. And I was just like, man, every dealership needs this because it does so many things uh, that if I do go to most dealers and I'm like, hey, this is what it does, X, Y and Z. They're like, well, my CRM is supposed to do that, but it's because my people aren't using it properly. Right. So they're blaming it on on their people. And that actually comes from the software companies and a lot of people in, I'm friends with a lot of guys that work at a lot of these companies, but uh, they don't like it when I say this, but it's just the truth. And it's one of the few things that you can actually sell to somebody and then blame them for not using it properly. Now there's a difference between not using it at all and not using it properly. Um, if you are using it and you're starting to use it, like let's make these things better for the end user. And the only reason I can say that is because the daily desk absolutely works to do a variety of things that you believe you're supposed to get out of a CRM. That's a tough pill to swallow. I'm already spending two, three grand a month for my CRM. And you're telling me you're going to give me this new thing that's actually going to do this. Uh, but that's really how it is. And those things are also the CRMs in our space are also overbuilt to print you out 450, 500 reports you're never really going to use. Um, and what ours does is it, it really helps you think better. It's not going to tell you what to do. And this is one of the biggest pieces of why we don't offer a full fledged CRM yet. We will. Our product is amazing. And what it does works as a, as in, in that video you just saw, it works as like an extra thing. You kind of are, if you have our system, what ends up happening is you use your CRM to data mine, send emails, collect internet leads. Uh, and if you do have your, Salespeople split into essentially the line, the old line system, closers, product specialist is what we call it nowadays, or fit specialist and assistant sales managers. If you've got that set up, it works even better uh, just because um, you've got the salespeople, the guys on the front end that are doing your demos, and essentially uh, there starts from the meet and greet to the sit down, right? And then you've got your assistant sales manager coming in. They still work out of their CRM but you're not as focused, you're not as, uh, really you get upset, right? Because you've got 40,000 people in your CRM and you're like, what's happening with these 40,000 people? Uh, but what our system does is really kind of, without even talking to it, it extracts what you really need to be looking at and prioritizes that for you. And the biggest issue with CRMs, and it's not just in our space, I'm 100% focused on our space. I'm not focused on anything outside of the auto world. And I don't think I will be for a decade or two decades, say I ever did uh, expand because there's so much to be fixed within our space. And it's that task follow-up system. 
when you have a system that's trying to tell people what to do for them because you think you know better about where they should be prioritizing their time and what they should do right now, it's like a light switch turns off in their mind that they can stop thinking and rely on the CRM to do their follow-up. Now, the difference between uh, salespeople out there that are doing that and salespeople that still have that light switch turned on and they're also using the CRM is what do they have? They've got a bunch of notepads on the side. I can go into any dealership. I can be like, who's your top guy? And I can actually find their hot sheet that's not available in any CRMs uh, just because it, it's essentially non-prioritized follow-up. And that's about as much as I want to talk about it uh, right there. But I love what you said about the BDC department. I had a similar experience, but I was actually in a dealership for a few years in the finance department. And then I was a sales manager. And when they implemented the BDC in our store in 2007, uh, I believe it was late 2007, uh, early 2008, somewhere around there. And remember I was in finance January, 2005. I'll never forget that. Uh, but when they brought the BDC department in, I actually got a, uh, I actually got written up and I got what's called an AR. I'm sure you know that term yeah. uh, for $700 because I decided to prank call. I look, I was a young guy in my early twenties. I decided to prank call the BDC and mess with them pretending I was a customer a bunch of times. And obviously when my GSM called me in and I'll never forget it, he was trying to figure out who was doing it. And I actually watched him for inside the tower, you know, from the, from outside in the showroom, think about it. And he was like, Cheat him, sales desk, <laughs> right? Because he just this, <laughs> he just he just sat there and thought for about twenty minutes and kind of figured it out himself. Uh, and when he pulled me in there, he's like, "Are you calling my girls in the back?" And I was like, "Oh man, you know." You sit there for a couple of seconds, and I was like, "Well, I can't lie because he's got to, you know." If I lie, then you know he's not going to believe anything else I tell him down the road when I'm being accused for, let's say, something I didn't do. And that's how my brain honestly worked at like 24 years old. That's how I thought about it. And uh, I was like, "Yes, Dave." And he pulls out his, you know, he pulls out his big, uh, his big thing, and he slides me a, a piece of paper. He's like, $700. I can't let the owner's going to know about this one. This one's going through." And he slides it to me, and I signed. Uh, you know, it cost me 700 bucks to prank call our BDC department. But long story short, I mean, moving further throughout my career, I agree with everything you said. Uh, I like in-house BDCs a lot better than outhouse BDCs or whatever you want to call it, remote BDC. Um, I like them in the house, definitely inside the building, uh, especially with our system. They actually will know when the customer goes uh, that's inside the showroom that they brought in. They're going to be able to see their initials on all the, on all the deals working that they've got. Uh, inside the store. And there's an opportunity there. I, I love, you know, BDCs that are engaged with the sales department. Uh, that's, that's the pinnacle, I think, that you want to get to where when that customer decides to leave and that deal's not going through, the BDC agent can actually come back out again and talk to them and maybe put that deal back together. That's something I think you should absolutely be doing uh, just because that is usually their first contact. That's who sold the appointment. That's who got them in. And just talking a little bit more about BDC because uh, you know one of the biggest things I had to address from the sales desk and sales meetings uh, to the teams, obviously, that I, that I managed was, you know, stop complaining about what BDC is bringing in. BDC's job is to bring people in. And I know that's changing a little bit right now, even from management's end, because they don't have the inventory. They want to make sure they're qualified uh, and all that. But remember, this is going to turn. This is going to change. We're going to have inventory again. It's not going to be like it is right now. Uh, we live in a, you know, an up and down economy. That's the way it's been in this country for a long time. So pretty soon that's going to switch. And you know, best practices are best practices. And I just wholeheartedly believe that your BDC should be bringing people in. And what I constantly used to say all the time is, you know, you don't complain when they bring you in deals. You only complain when they bring you in somebody that you couldn't, you couldn't get to buy. But uh, if you want to do it right, your BDC should be bringing everybody in. I think the pre-qualifications, if any, uh, I'd probably be veered towards no pre pre qualifications, but if any pre qualifications, they should be pretty light. I know that changes and now is a little bit different time. Uh, so 
you know, maybe you're doing that. I'm not going to tell you that uh, it's horrible, but I think best practices uh, is definitely, um, you know, allowing your BDC to just bring people in. He has proven methods that really work. If you want to make more money, take these classes. He's intense, truthful, and he knows what he's doing. Check him out. Ron Garvick, man, where to start with this guy? Um, I've had the pleasure of working under him for the past four years. He's my manager up at Street Volkswagen, and it's just been an amazing experience. I came in as a green pea with no experience, and you know he's went over and taught me a lot of you know a lot of great stuff with the car business, whether it's negotiating, uh, trade appraisals, walk arounds, you name it. He's went over it with me, and I'm super appreciative. He brings a ton to the table, you know, a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of experience. He's worked the desk. He's, you know, he's worked every position, you know, BDC, sales. He's done everything in the dealership. So he has a wealth of knowledge and, you know, having those credentials behind him really solidifies what he's saying. You know, he knows his shit. He's good at what he does. He's had results. So definitely listen to Rod Garbrick, man. Uh, I'm very blessed to have him at the dealership and be able to learn from him directly. So tons of good stuff. Can't wait for y'all to check it out. Hello guys, my name is Joel Marquez and I highly recommend Ron Garbrick's sales training because he's very passionate at what he does. Uh, me and Ron have been working together for over five years, uh, two different dealerships. I went from making two to $2,500 to pushing over $10,000 a month. Uh, yes, I'm currently over $100,000 year to date in about eight and a half months. I highly recommend you guys take advantage of all his courses. He's great at what he does. Thank you guys, have a blessed day. Before, we'd always be late and on empty. Now we're just late. Kids! Before, no one used to listen to me. Hello, ID? I'm cold. Before, we couldn't take in the sweet sounds of nature. Seriously. Before it can change the world, it has to change yours. The all-new, all-electric Volkswagen ID4. And we are back with Philip Cheatham. How are you doing, my friend, again? What's happening, Ron? How are you? Good to see you, man. Man, you know, it, when, it, when it comes to interviewing people on a podcast, you usually get technical difficulties every once in a while. But we're going to go ahead and we're splicing this all together because this is like the third take. That's perfectly fine with me. Um one thing I wanted to ask about with the BDC is <clears throat> I, I always, when I was the BDC manager, I always told my agents that the BDC is not the business development center, but it's actually the big dollar center. That's where all the money gets poured into for marketing and advertising to draw traffic into your dealership. They're the heartbeat that the blood flows through to get to parts, service, and to sales and usually sometimes it, it gets to the gm also um but you know at at the bdc that we're at they we have the bdc agents they actually get incentives for setting up appointments that show um, and they also get um an incentive if they sell and they also get an incentive. They are actually our product delivery specialists. So the salesman will first make the initial uh, product presentation. Then you have where the BDC agent is the last but not least product uh, specialist when it goes to doing the delivery, where they're setting up the um uh, the favorite radio stations, they're setting up their phone, they're showing them all the gadgets on inside the vehicle. The good part about that, because I know some dealers are like, why would you have them do the delivery? Product knowledge. Because it doesn't matter if you're a salesperson or if you're a BDC agent, you still need to have that product knowledge. So everybody has to get whatever the manufacturer is certified. In this case, Volkswagen certified. With that being said, it also gives the salesman time to go and get the tag ready, go in and follow, get get everything ready if, with their trade-in, if they have a trade-in, and bring it to the sold unit 
so they can transfer all the stuff from one vehicle into another. So I think it's it's highly educational that we do that for both the salespeople and the delivery specialist uh, BDC agent because it gives them an idea of the process. And you'd be surprised how many times that the customer, when they come back to buy another vehicle or trade that vehicle in, they remember the BDC agent before they remember the salesperson. And that's completely sad. Yeah. So I, I, I like that process. Uh, it, the only thing that the only place I would see is like, so they're answering phone calls and they're doing the internet leads and then they're doing deliveries. So you're pulling them, you're pulling them away from that computer. Uh, but I, uh, yeah, I totally, I totally get what you're, what you're doing there, which is super cool. Um, the incentivizing on the sale, I'm all for, uh, I do look at it like their job is to bring the customer in, uh, not do too many pre-qualifications. I know times right now are a little bit different where a lot of dealers feel like they want to pre-qualify a lot of customers before they come in, uh, just because inventory is low and, you know, it's a, it's a high demand, uh, area right now. We all know that's going to change. Uh, so I do, I wouldn't go too much from best practices, which is absolutely, you know, their job, their first and foremost job is to bring people in off the phone. I think, you know, the biggest thing I ever said in my sales meetings over and over and over again about BDC with BDC in the meetings, of course, was saying, Hey, these guys job is to bring them in your jobs to sell them. You don't complain when they bring you a perfect buyer. Right. Uh, so I know there's dealerships kind of veering a little bit. Uh, the other way on that right now, just because of the environment that we're in, but that is their absolute job. Now, what's interesting is when you incentivize them and pay them for the sale. Uh, I've seen it. I've heard a lot of smart people talk about it uh, and I've been around it. Uh, when you do that, it, their sales will go up. So uh, I don't think it's a lot of pre-qualifications. I think what's actually happening there is kind of what you're doing in your dealership where they're just inserted more into the whole process, right? Uh, so that's what I would see the huge benefit about what you're doing in there, uh, which is they are there to uh, you know, finalize the sale, which means they're gonna care about the sale the whole time it's, it's happening. So it's not so much pre-qualification, it's not so much uh, setting up the sale and teeing up the sale. But where I see it help the most is when that deal's being negotiated in the showroom uh, and those kinds of areas, hey, we can bring the BDC agent that they already trust that brought them into the dealership into that sale. Uh, and if you're actually using uh, the daily desk, uh, you know, the reason I, I left from inside the dealership, literally the only reason, and now I'm dedicated to uh, this and, and uh, a lot of other things that we do, trainings, et cetera. But um, you actually, your BDC department, uh, not to pitch here, but it's just real. Uh, if you're using the daily desk, the BDC department will see uh, because there's only a few things that you have to do and you have to do them to make sure you get all these other benefits out of the system. Uh, they'll actually see and they're glued to it because they want to know when their deals close. They'll see when their customer is leaving and they'll know why. And then they can jump out of their chair and go talk to that customer, uh, maybe get them to sit back down uh, and those kinds of things. So when you're only incentivizing for the appointment, uh, pretty much your BDC is not going to care whether this deal sells or not. Uh, and that's just not really the culture and the morale that you want to have. So I think this is a, just another one of those discussions that gets confusing where you tell BDC agents, hey, we're going to split it and start paying you for sale. Uh, they might get scared at first. They might think that their pay plan's being messed with. They might think that that's not their job to sell the car and it's not. And I don't think that you should push that on them. Uh, but uh, I do I do like the incentivizations for sales because I know what happens where everybody ends up working together as a team and they at least care about the result. Uh, so there's X amount of times that they are going to get involved uh, are going to make a huge difference. Man, I made a couple deals in a 300 car store. Uh, I say this all the time is almost a percent. Right. So you need. <laughs> right. So. The good thing about the car business is you can adapt and and retweak over 
over the months or over the years because you know back in the day there was no bdc there was pieces of paper you write every customer's name down where they live their address their telephone number how many kids they have how many uh dogs they have would they currently drive before they came in and bought this one and so forth so and then in those little index cards i always ho heard horror stories about index cards where they would just flip through them and go oh someone's got a birthday today i better call them you know we don't call <laughs> people we don't really call people anymore do follow-ups wishing them a happy birthday wishing them a happy anniversary on that vehicle asking how the kids are going or doing ask them how little jimmy's soccer game went little susie's graduation we don't follow up because they don't have the sense of urgency they already sold the customer they already sold the customer a car. So in the in the salespeople's mind, they're just looking for that that next fix. It's like a drug, you know. And I tell these guys, you're the, the selling cars is like an addiction. You always go after the next person. But once you sold them the car, I mean, it's like old news. It's like an old girlfriend you don't want to have, or a booty call that you don't want to have anymore. You don't want to call them back. Why? Because you don't want to be told how terrible you were. B, you don't want to, uh, you already had a bad experience with that customer, or you don't want to hear the negativity like, hey, how's that car? I mean, is it still running? I mean, do you still love it? And you hear, I traded it off because it wasn't what we really wanted, or man, it's got a knocking sound in it. So you, they, they don't want to hear the negativity. And the funny thing is, it all comes together. It, if yeah. you are upfront and honest with yourselves or with your customer and they say, Hey, I got a knocking sound. And you know, for sure that they bought an extended service contract, man, right then and there, you're like, Hey, don't worry about it. Bring it in. Our service department is going to fix it for you and take care of you. And, you know, possibly we'll get you in a loan or drive while this one's getting fixed, but they're so scared to follow up. It, it's, you know, I, and I was that, that salesperson before when I first got into business, I was like, you call the customer to follow up and they're just so negative and, and complaining about everything. Then all of a sudden, and then you walk into the sales tower and you're like, boss, man, Mr. Smith, he, he's a little pissed off at us right now. Whoa, whoa what's going on? You know, they they said that we forced them in, into that, that focus. Well, that was the vehicle they came in on. I understand that boss, but, you know, they think that we were forcing them into it. And he's like, well, that's ridiculous. Call them back and tell them they're stupid. I mean, you don't want to do that. <laughs> you don't have all the words to, to overcome that, that complaint, except what the GM just told you to do. So, you know, I had to tweak myself and, and start reading books and watching videos on how to overcome complaints like that. And be completely upfront and honest with customers. And, you know, the more you were upfront and, and honest with your customers, that's where you get to repeat business. Because you took their BS when they weren't happy and you treated them nice. And they, they were like, man, this guy took every bit of bullshit that I gave him. And he's still being so nice to us. We got to go back to him because there's not a person that I know that we bought cars over the years that took all the crap that I gave him and still smiled and said, don't worry, we're going to get you taken care of. Just smile and move on. That will gain a lot of more uh, uh, customers coming back to you because then you can you can BS with them when they're complaining, going, you know what? Are you just a complainer? Because you know, Hunt, Mr. Smith, every time I sell you a car, you complain. But then every time it's time to buy another car, you come back to me. Uh, is it me that you love or is it just you want to give me all the bullshit because nobody has ever taken it with a grain of salt and pushed it back and said, you know what, we'll go sweep that under the rug. Let's let's solve this problem. Let's get you in something that you really like. But there's so many, I, you know, when salesmen come to my office, they're like, Yo, why ain't I getting an internet lead? Or, yo, why is that 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 salesman getting my customer? I sold him three years ago. But did you follow up? Well, that was such nope. a funny one. Yeah, you didn't. You didn't follow <laughs> up. Why did you get this internet lead? Well, you know they were my customer. Then you should have followed up. This is a relationship business. Damian Boudreaux has said it wait, several wait, times. Wait, Ron. At least do I get on half that deal? 
Did you follow up with them? I know, but I sold them three times. Did I get half the deal? You know, if you didn't follow up with them for the last two years, then you build no relationship with them. You build no rapport with them. Why would you consider yourself able to have that opportunity to get a split deal? You let me know and I'll give you my answer. Love that. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I, I put a firm stake in the ground myself just on split deals to begin with. Uh, I'm of the exact same mindset you're talking about, Ron, which is they come to the desk and they're, hey, I, I belong on half that deal. I think most of you were to print out, uh, you know, what were they, uh, did you talk to them in the last 72 hours, last 48 hours, whatever it is uh, for me. And this sounds harsh to a lot of people, but it's actually not, it's actually more fair. Uh, it's a lot more fair and it actually breeds uh, confidence and it breeds, uh, it breeds best practices really because you're going to stay on top of your customer. It breeds strength. Uh, which is no split deals. Uh, you know, if you bring me a deal and it's like, hey, I'm supposed to be on half this deal because I test drove them and blah, 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 blah. And I talked to them back then or, hey, even, oh, they're my uncle. They work with my uncle. Well, even worse. And Ron closed them and you couldn't and you didn't stay on top of them. How did you lose exactly. that deal? Horrible customer control, and it's really not fair to the person that made the deal, that made the close. And one of the worst things that happens inside dealerships, I don't know how owners put up with it. I don't know how, I, I literally, it boggles my mind how you put up with this, but it's happening in most dealerships where a customer will walk in your showroom on Saturday and uh, Ron or Phil won't be here and the customer will ask for Ron and Phil and all your other salesmen go, well, I don't want to do that now because it's only going to be half a deal. So you're literally incentivizing your own sales staff to run away from your customers because you already talked to them and decided not to be there today. Versus if you don't have split deals, everybody up there is like, give it to me, give it to me. I'm going to close it and take it from Ron or take it from Phil, which is perfectly okay. And what goes around comes around and all the drama at the sales desk and excuse my language, total BS uh, and the amount of stuff that you're stuffing on your sales managers to sit there. Their, their job is to hold gross and you've got them half the day sitting there deciding who goes on what drama and after they make a decision there's more drama and then a guy's by the water cooler crapped out um it, it it's uh it's the worst process process um but at most dealerships have it and I, I really truly believe the only reason most dealerships have it is they haven't worked without it because when i bring this up to most dealers they're like oh but phil uh, that's not fair because this, because that, because this. And oh, then the funniest one that I'll hear nonstop is, oh, we have the, uh, you know, the 75 commandments of split deals. So it works at our store. It's, it's, put, <laughs> it's put up in the, in the sales desk where you have to have done this. You have to have done that. You have, yeah, it's really simple. You close it, you get it. You don't close it, you don't get it. Have customer control. Uh, and close these deals it happens not to go on on it but uh, i've been in dealerships in la where guy there's some really smart salesmen out there and we'll actually uh touch a lot of customers on the first phone call on the first email on the first up on the lot and they'll put their name on a lot of different deals and then they'll run away from all these customers let everybody else close it and just get on half deals uh so that's a strategy but Philip, that totally I, I said <laughs> <laughs> but Philip, I said, I said hi to them. So is that a split deal? Exactly. Right. So, but you know, they put them in this, I put them in the CRM. Uh, I want to, I want to talk about one thing you talked about because you were talking about calling for birthdays, calling for this, calling for that. Um, and granted, look before CRM, so I'm not going to blame it on CRMs. I would never do that. Uh, I, we're going to be honest and real about this right now, but before CRMs, um, you know, you had a certain amount of salespeople doing that and they do it by printing out the photo with them and the customer and attaching it to the guest card. I mean, I've seen just so many variety of different 
uh, strategies to make sure that they're sending their customers the birthday cards. They're, you know, they're doing all those different things um, and following up with them and keeping that relationship going, you know, for the three year intermittent that, they, that they're not going to be back to buy a car from you, uh, perhaps getting referrals, which is, oh, my goodness, you know, the, oh, that's crazy to ask for referrals. Uh, that's probably the best way to build a business inside of a business. Uh, and we've all seen the guys do it. Now, they're few and far between. They're rare. Right. It's a rare it's a rare salesman. Well, it's still a rare salesman after the CRM when the CRM is supposed to do all these things for you. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it made it worse or I know it made it worse uh, to the fact of the way that the CRM is set up is, hey, Ron, you don't have to worry about the birthday cards. It's set it and forget it. It's going to send them that birthday email. It's going to do this. You kind of just got to follow and do your tasks. Uh, and do it. So what happens with the people inside the dealership, the people actually sit in front of these CRMs, the way that they're designed is, hey, this thing's smarter than you and it's going to do this for you. So go ahead and turn your own brain off. Um, and that's, you know, if you go back to the old guys that were doing it before the CRM and the guys that are doing it today, they still have that book with the pictures they took with the customer staple to the guest card. They still have their old process. The, the CRM didn't really facilitate the process any much better. And, you know, if you've got a GSM and that's all he does is clean up the CRM and make sure, all you, you know, that's what your GSM does and that's his new job. Uh, you know, but we, we need to have their brains turned on, not off and relying on this computer system. You need to have them more, you know, awake to what they're doing, the why they're doing it, uh, right? And that's what's going to breed more more of them and then inside your store is always the best if you've, if you've got a guy there 10 or 15 years or you've got a guy stepping up to the plate and making it work for them uh, that's staying on top of all those things but there is a piece there where, where we're actually telling uh, salespeople from the top hey just use your CRM and turn your brain and that's not going to develop any new guys with those books you know they end up 10 year guys they'll show you they, they got these books of like pictures of them, you know, they're doing it on paper. And obviously the CRM makes a lot more sense. Hey, it's going to do it uh, with a software and it's going to organize it for you. But we just don't, you don't want your guys' brains turned off. And I think that's a, that's a plague right now. So. Sales managers, salespeople, your CRM is your ATM. That's what I got to tell you. Your CRM is your ATM. That is how you're going to make your money. If you follow up with your customers, if you touch base with them, if a customer comes into the dealership, make sure that they're not already in the system. Don't make up a new lead. Be honest, because if it happens to you, you're going to be pissed. If you go and make sure that no one has ever talked to this customer, when you scan their driver's license and all their information goes into the, the CRM, and I know most of the CRMs right now, they do have that technology, your dealer socket, your VIN solutions, your e-leads, they all, you scan the driver's license, the information goes into the system. And if it pops up that David has talked to this customer in the last two weeks and their name is, and he put it in there as Jonathan, but then you type it in as John and make it a new lead. You are not being honest. You are not being trustworthy and you It'll come back 10 times fold. If you are not honest and say, you know what? I see that you were talking to David a couple of weeks ago. Let me go ahead and let David know that you're here so we can get you taken care of. Because what we don't do here at ABC Motors is we don't take customers from salespeople. And if they say, I don't like David, I don't want to work with him. Then you could say, okay, I totally understand. But let me go ahead and, and take care of you now. You won't have to deal with David. And, now, and then later on, you can tell David, hey, I was talking to this customer. He was your customer. They don't want to deal with you. And if David's the kind of salesperson that we hope that he is, he's going to say, don't worry about it. Just go ahead and take care of them and we'll split it. And that's one really of the biggest things, Ron, right? Like the, uh, you know, that just getting caught up that in the moment, like I'm upset with something that happened right now and it's just going to crap out the rest of my day. Uh, it goes hand in hand with, you know, remembering the payments that uh, that you're doing on your deals. I mean, there's so many different ways we can shoot ourselves in the foot. Uh, I, 
I actually loved the old uh, phrase of, um, but I've heard it used for different things now. And they're like, oh, don't use that. But the old phrase of like being a little dumb, you know, uh, and just kind of keeping yourself in the moment, I think is what that really means to me, uh, which is, you know, if I see, obviously it's going to sting. I see one of my deals go to somebody else and they didn't call me, they didn't ask for me, whatever it is, or somebody skated me and this, that, and the other. But the longer that on that, um, the, you know, the more it's going to mess me up in the moment, it's going to mess up, mess me up in the future. I mean, we all know this, like the quicker you can, first of all, uh, you know, if you want to get to management and you want to be the GM, the best way is not even to sell the most cars. The best way is to be the coolest, most calmest collected guy in the store. It's to be the guy that everybody comes to. Uh, and it's to be the guy that nobody ever really sees you sweat. You know, you work good under heat, you work good under stress. Uh, and you, you're the guy that everybody wants to go to, to share their problems with. That's who I'm going to put as my GM, not necessarily, uh, my GSM or my top sales manager or, you know, my top finance manager, whatever it may be. I'm going to look for the guy in any one of those positions uh, that's actually going to be the coolest, calmest guy in the store um, that handles problems without getting flustered and mad at everybody else and crapped out for two more days. Uh, because exactly. that's, you know, that's what's going to give you the ability of, of being a true leader. Uh, so, you know, back to your example that, you know, David, uh, the best thing David can do there, he doesn't want to work with me. Awesome. You know, everybody doesn't like me. That's why some other people love me. Right. Boom. Move on. And that's the way of the world. Everybody's not going to like what you say. Everybody's not going to like what you do. Everybody's not going to like you. Some people just aren't going to like you. So there's look I, as much as I don't like being that and against that, there's some people out there that just rub me the wrong way that I don't want to deal with. And I don't even know why. Right. Uh, so don't ever take that the wrong way. I always used to tell my guys nonstop uh, your big one of your biggest assets. I'm not going to say the biggest asset, but one of your biggest assets inside the car business is what we all know what it is. It's thick skin um, and it's being able to let stuff brush off you and just, you know, always be on that. Always be on that reset mode and finance, too. You know, the, the, the guys crapped themselves out on the last five deals that they did. I used to say the reason, you know, the, the best thing you can do to keep yourself good is get one of those men in black, uh, you know, the thing that he, uh, <laughs> he, like, he hits and erases your memory. You want to be, yeah, you need one, a neuralizer. You need a neuralizer inside the car dealership. It's your absolute best friend. You just went through a bunch. Somebody just stole your deal. Neuralize yourself. You just did five bad deals in a row. Neuralize yourself. Customer you got all the facts to you that wasn't Yeah. <laughs> Customer said something to you you didn't like, just neuralize yourself. And just always, there was also that movie, right? Uh, I think it was Ace Ventura, where the guy every five seconds reset. That's oh, yeah. Another, that's another way you can look at it. That's perfect. So that every customer, you're going with the same energy, you're going with the same confidence, you're going with the same enthusiasm, uh, and you're going up to them that way. And you're not remembering about all the drama that happened even two minutes ago, five minutes ago. It'll kill you. That's uh, good, that's like, that's just the good gold. Thing, the good thing about, you know, when you were talking about finance, uh, as the finance director, I look at all the deals and I figure out, okay, Mr. Smith, I look at the driver's license. I'm like, he's 80 years old. I know who can work with him. This one goes to Joel. And then I look at it, okay. This one's a young group. They, they're all about performance. They're all about speed. This one has to go to JJ because he can relate to them. Then if, if they're difficult ones, you know, they're, you know, they're those grinders and those disrespectful customers. I look at them and go, okay, this one's going to go to Tyler because Tyler knows how to handle them. And then I'll look at some, oh, this is a lay down. This is a Poor cool Tyler, one. man. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, he, and he knows how to take care of him. He could, and sometimes you got to go. I'll have, I'll be able to be taking the uh, the grinder one, and you know, I'm not buying crap. Don't even talk to me about it. I'm like, okay, yeah. cool. Um, you're gonna be, 
you know, by this conversation, you look like you're going to be self-insured, no problem. So anything that happens to your vehicle after the four year, 50,000 mile limited warranty. And I mean limited because you have two job responsibilities, drive the vehicle the way they need to be driven. So no Dukes of Hazzard, no Fast and the Furious, no crazy stuff like that. And do your schedule maintenance. And if you don't do your schedule maintenance, and I highly suggest you do it here, but if you don't do your schedule maintenance, you go to a mom and pop shop and get it done. And they happen to mess up on your vehicle, which then you come back to the dealership and realize, Hey, you know what? Your properly maintenance wasn't done. Now your warranty is going to be voided. I know that you're self-insured that you can just cut out a check for $11,000 for a brand new engine. I can't do that. Oh, you can't. Well, let me talk to you about how I can save you some money so you don't have to write out a $11,000 check if your engine happens to blow. And if you don't do this, 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 and this, and this, this is going to cost you this, 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 and this, and this. And they're like, I'll take it all. And I'm like, that's how you, yeah, you have to, to mirror yourself with the customer that's in front of you, because you could be, and like I tell the guys, you could be nice to them. They're still going to be rude, but, but if they want to go and um, be difficult towards you, you have to be able to adapt to their culture and to their mindset. And I love customers. I love how they interact. You know, the older ones that come in, uh, that they try to be hard, but then when you educate them on why it's important to get this certain kind of protection, they're all like, you know what? I appreciate your honesty. I appreciate that you want to take care of me. I'm going to go ahead and get it and whatever else you could throw in that will save me money. Let's go ahead and do it. And that's the customers you want. You want to educate them. You don't want to sell them. You just want to educate them. And just like in BDC, you don't want to sell them anything except the appointment. Let the customer sell themselves on the product that they've seen online and let the salesperson be the one that can earn their business, not just on this vehicle, but on every vehicle that they choose to buy from now on. That's who you want that salesman to to be is to be the salesman that every time the customer comes in, they look at him and say, you need to hurry up and sell me another car. Philip, it has been a pleasure. I know we've had technical difficulties. It's been a pleasure having you on and, and being part of this show, the Automotive Architect Sales Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to, to get involved and, and get on to listening to Philip, because he's got a lot to share. Philip, Philip has got a lot of knowledge, and you catch him on Clubhouse every once in a while, drinking a cocktail, smoking a cigar, talking about the BDC and the processes. But also, you've got to check his book out, the the dealership process secrets. You got to check that out. You got to go to his website. You've got to get involved with everything that that Philip has to offer. Get get involved in his daily desk. Call him, text him, email him, get his products. This, if, it, if it's going to help you succeed and beat these Carvanas and beat these rooms and have that humor, in, or hu humor human interaction and get it, humor unlike these other vending machine <laughs> people out there. You know, and it's funny because of the processes and, and you know, for so long, the old school people didn't believe about – uh, virtual or not virtual, but digital retailing. Man, I sold my cars on via text message. I closed deals on via text message. I sent videos of the car that they were looking at on via text messages due to the fact I wanted it a smooth process. I was busy. Yes. Do you want this car? Here are the numbers. We'll agree to them. Yes, we'll agree. All right. When can I expect you to come in? I'm coming in at 2.30. When you come in at 2.30, we'll take the car for a test drive. I already have fuel in it. I already have it clean for delivery. As soon as you say, man, this is it. I'll get you into finance. You'll be in there for 15 minutes signing that beautiful paperwork. And then in and out, you're back into your new vehicle that you're going to park in your driveway tonight. Some dealerships didn't believe in that. So, Get into this daily desk, get into uh, central desking, get the book, The Dealership Process Secrets, and tune in to his podcast any chance you get. Philip, if you had one thing to tell a brand new salesperson getting into the automotive industry, what would that one piece of advice be? 
Same thing I tell every single uh, salesperson in my interview process that I do. And that is no matter where you are, you may not think that this is going to be a long term business for you. And most people getting into the industry don't. But remember, you're going to take all of your habits that you learn here somewhere else. So if your next thing is something you're going to school for or your next thing is another industry that you want to be in, develop habits in this industry that's going to take you there. Uh, and really that you're going to learn a ton about people and it's an awesome business and it's going to basically teach you and give you the foundation uh, and stepping stones to anything else that you want to do. Uh, I don't think there's any other business where you learn as much as you do as quickly as you do about people. So that is whether you're going to be in it long term or you're going to be in it short term, uh, treat it as a stepping stone to where you want to be. There's a ton you can learn and have a ton of fun while you do it. Don't worry about your uh, your month. Oh my goodness, I had a 10 grand month. I had a four grand month because I can tell you uh, I was supposed to have 10 grand months and had four grand months for whatever reason within my career. That does not matter today. It was 15, 17 years ago. What matters today is all the experiences and the habits that I developed inside the dealership. Uh, you know, that six grand that I missed out on because I had bad CSI or I had a bad month or this happened with the pay plan or this deal pulled through or, or fell through, whatever it is, none of that stuff is going to matter in 10 years from now. What matters in 10 years is your experiences and uh, how you did your job, the habits that you develop and the person that that you know you became inside that dealership so that i think is the absolute most important piece of advice that you can give rather than trying to talk people into the business long term and everything because i didn't think i was going to be in this business long term until about my eighth year uh in the business when i watched somebody that i brought in that i hired uh end up on the sales desk and that as i'm saying it i get goosebumps that is what made me go gotcha okay uh, no matter what I'm, this is what I'm supposed to be doing for the rest of my life. And this is what I'm supposed to dedicate my life to, but that's not what I push on anybody new coming into the business. Uh, I'd rather tell them it's a stepping stone and a great place to learn and a great place to develop habits. Exactly. 100%. Dealer process secret podcast is presented by central desky. Make sure you tune in to his, uh, all the platforms, wherever it may be. On it's everywhere. There you go. iHeartRadio, Spotify, Pandora, Audible, Amazon, Apple Podcasts. You got it all right there. Philip, pleasure of having you on. I think our our audience got a whole bunch of golden nuggets today. And if I had uh, ching ching sound effects, I would just be dropping them in. I appreciate you being on. Let the audience know how they can reach you. Uh, so I'm pretty much everywhere. Book www.philipcheatham.com. You can use one L or two. My name is spelled with one, or you can get it off Audible. I know a lot of people like to do that. They don't care about me giving it to them for free. Uh, and uh, centraldesking.com. Uh, check me out on Clubhouse. Uh, you know, send me a uh, request on LinkedIn. If you're in the car business, I like talking to everybody. So if you message me on Facebook, uh, I've still got, a, you know, I think 400 people I can add on Facebook or something like that. Uh, if you're in the car business and you send me a request, you're definitely getting a yes. Uh, if you send me a messenger, I, I'll definitely help you out. I actually like to help people out with their resumes all the time. Just look at them, give them a couple pointers here and there. I'm not going to do it for you, uh, but you know anything, I'm still pretty available to, to everybody out there. So if you need any help, you want to talk, you want to pick my brain, uh, I'm there. And philip at centraldusting.com is, uh, is my actual email that I look at every single day. Thank you, Ron, so much for having me on and uh, appreciate your uh, your awesome introduction, uh, everything. You're awesome. Uh, everything. Really appreciate you. Uh, I've been listening to your podcast, too, and uh, super cool stuff. So uh, awesome. And look forward to look forward to getting together with you again, man. Thank yes, you. Sir. It's been a pleasure. Actually, you have 390 available spots on your Facebook right now. So if you want to be part of his his uh, friends on its friends list. You need to get on there before all 390 is up because once you're 
5,001, you're going to get a rejection. Yeah. And it's kind of funny. Uh, I got several people that want me to be their friends and I'll go and accept it. And so it's declined because there's over 5,000. So I'll have to send them a private message going, Hey, I, I can't be your friend. You're already got 5,000. <laughs> okay. Well, let me filter through and see what I could do. And, and I'll take some of them off. I can, you don't have to do that. No, 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 no. I, I got to, got to, got to have you on here. So it I is feel the same way. I feel like I'm going to have to do that once that gets filled out, because if you're in that, look, if you're in the auto business or you're in solar like i got a lot of people in the solar game because i guess the uh you know people from the auto business are going into the into the solar business but uh you know when it when i get to five thousand i'm gonna i'm gonna be deleting you solar guys for for auto guys sorry about that <laughs> it is what it is my friend but thank you again it's been a pleasure we'll talk soon awesome